Hi, and welcome to the Clayton Newt's Generative AI Vodcast Series. I'm your host, Will Howe. I lead Clayton Newt's data analytics team, where we are building with generative AI technologies. Really excited about today's session. We're covering fraud and what that means for good and for bad uh, from generative AI. And I'm pleased to be joined by two fantastic guests today. Uh, first is Ananya Roy. Ananya is a special counsel in our commercial litigation practice. Uh, she works across a variety of matters, and she's also a senior lawyer in our white collar crime practice and is currently working on civil fraud issues at the moment. And that's Ananya. Also joining me today is TJ. TJ is a director in our forensic practice, and he's a forensic accountant, having worked on fraud matters in Australia and all over the world. So looking forward to the insights. Welcome, TJ and Ananya. And maybe actually, TJ, we'll start to you with you. Uh, where does generative AI and fraud intersect? Thank you. Well, yes, it's an interesting area. Um, what we see in history is that the crooks are always two steps ahead of those of us that are trying to catch them or prevent it. So I think it's got two angles. The first one is how will the crooks use this technology either to generate new um, technologies and new scams, but also how can they enhance the existing scams that they have in place to increase their rate of return from a financial perspective, so to speak. And um, what we've seen is we are using AI in a number of ways to detect fraud. Banks use it to detect fraudulent transactions, real-time monitoring. We've seen it being used to validate employee expenses, as an example. And we've also seen it being used to detect false invoices. What I think is going to happen, companies won't be left, left with any choice, but actually adapt that technology to make sure that they stay as much as they can ahead of the crooks. So that's where I see it's going to go. And obviously, this this topic is really on the mind of a lot of people in corporate Australia at the moment. But maybe if we could just cover a few fundamentals. And Ananya, what's actually the definition of fraud? Thanks, Will. From a legal perspective, there are slightly different definitions or elements of fraud, depending on whether you're pursuing from a criminal offence perspective or from a civil perspective. For a criminal offence of fraud, a person will have committed fraud if they have, by any deception or dishonesty, obtained property belonging to another person or obtained financial disadvantage advantage or obtained a financial caused a financial disadvantage from a civil claim perspective fraud can be proved if there's a false representation that is made knowing that it's false or if you're reckless as to whether it's false or true so the slight nuance in the definition is that the criminal offense requires that element of dishonesty or deception and the reason those general definitions are important is because to the extent that we are prosecuting a fraud matter before the court, those are the elements that a court will look at fraud through. Um, and you do get different types of fraud generally. So we're going to focus on today on corporate fraud rather than perhaps cyber fraud, um, which warrants a separate session. But those general areas of fraud all do ultimately fall into those definitions that I've covered. And given the significant enhancements or developments in the generative AI space and what that means for fraud, as TJ has touched on, I think those definitions provide a very useful lens through which we can sort of view fraud through the lens of the court's eyes. Well, and that's the definitions through the lens of the court. This, there's another term that we use, TJ, the, the fraud triangle. Can you cover a bit on the fraud triangle? The fraud triangle is around from the 1950s, so it's actually been used quite widely and when we look at when we look at fraud. So it was developed by Donald Cressy. Um, the model says that for fraud to occur, there must be three elements present. Opportunity, um, rationalization, or pressure or incentive as, a, as an alternative. We, the model is quite useful when we want to detect or prevent fraud. When you think of um, behavior and scenarios, looking at those three elements is quite useful to understand how can we minimize those elements to, to prevent or detect fraud, especially the opportunity side. From an opportunity perspective, that's the one area that a company has most control over. So if you think of a fit for purpose control environment that you have in place, that's the ideal that you want that you want. It's also sometimes interesting when you look at that opportunity and you look at the control environment, 
to be able to determine is this a fraud is it an error or is it just maybe a process that was that wasn't properly designed so it's a good way that you can look at look at um, examples of fraud to determine what's the issue behind it well and, and maybe that point tj you know you talk about the opportunity and the control side maybe can we talk about the risk side a little bit so let's get right into it you know where is the risk from this generative ai maybe tj so from a corporate fraud perspective you have the um pressure so at the moment in the current economic and climate, climate that we operate in there's a lot of pressure on on individuals we see interest rates rising pressure on personal finances so that's that, that that's raising from an opportunity perspective, again, coming out of the pandemic, we've seen quite a disruption in control environments. So as people are trying to normalize their operations and companies normalize their operations, we see that increasing opportunity. Talking about from a cyber perspective, there's obviously an incentive to um, cyber criminals to increase the again, their return that they get from their efforts. So that incentive is there again, pressure and opportunities also from a, a customer's perspective because um, companies are using electronic communication more and more. So that just creates the opportunity for cyber criminals to take the advantage of that. So it's almost like it's coming together as a perfect storm. Some of the things that I think we are going to see is using generative AI, the development of false reviews and false um, product product reviews that that may um, change people's views in, rightly or wrongly on certain products, but also more from a corporate fraud is if you think of share price manipulation. If I can use chat GPT as an example to generate mass false information that can either increase or decrease the share price of a, com of a company, Criminals can use that information then to buy or sell shares and make profit of that. They can just, they can um, remove themselves from the actual financial instrument by buying, say, for example, a linked uh, or indexed um, product that will be very hard to detect. So you may see some of those activities happening um, through the use of this technology. It raises the question of whether we'll need an expert on generative AI to come before a court and explain to a judge how the technology is being used there by a crook or how it could have been used and whether that can be proven from an evidentiary point of view. Well, that is actually really interesting, generating all of this new information. And, you know, immediately most of the world is now thinking about what that means for good opportunities. You know, no doubt there's lots of positive opportunities for the world. But actually, to your point, there's some negative sides to that as well, too. And uh, TJ, maybe w where do you see the opportunity for the crooks in this generative AI? There's been a case recently where JP Morgan bought a company called Frank in the US for 175 million US dollars. Obviously, they did their due diligence and um, through that process, they wanted to understand how many customers do you have. Um, Frank said, we have 4 million customers. JP Morgan asked for um, support and evidence for that. So they produced a database of 4 million customers. In, two, in January 2023, just a few months ago, JP Morgan shut down that platform because they learned that uh, most of those email addresses are fake when they wanted to do an email campaign. In the core documents, linking back to Ananya's points, in the core documents that they've um, that they um, submitted, they alleged that the owner, the previous owner of Frank, approached a data science professor who um, created what we call scientific data. So 4, 4 million records, customer records were produced using the 293,000 existing customers for Frank. So they um, created email names, addresses, email addresses, um, all sorts of personal data that was produced as part of that. So, well, that is a perfect example to show where that technology and has been used. And that is a form of generative AI that's been used in this case. That's fascinating, TJ. Thanks. And, um, and Anya, it'd be really interesting. Obviously, one of the things that's also talked about is, well, employees are actually using this to do their job. And with the, ri the rise of work from home, you know, the employees are out there and, you know, are they actually typing out this information or is generative AI being able to use the job? And what's the legal footing for if that was to sort of start to happen? <laughs> 
Thanks, Will. Uh, that is a really interesting question because it is one of the advantages of ChatGPT that it arguably could make our jobs easier. There's probably a couple of considerations we've touched on in our previous episodes. So, for example, there's an, there's copyright issues that come to mind. Um, Christy and Jeremy flag the importance of having very clear policies within the workplace about how you might use generative AI. But for me, the other very interesting question that arises from this is, what is the duty of care that we owe to our clients in this situation? In many of in many professional services companies, we do owe a duty of care to provide services with reasonable or due skill and care. Um, and then the question becomes, well, how does that interact or how does that arise in the context where we are now providing services possibly using generative AI? Uh, you know, and that may be a question that the court has to determine one day, but, you know, from my perspective, from a practical perspective today, I would emphasise the importance of being transparent. So if a customer or a client is expecting that something will be manually performed um, and, you know, a company is proposing to do that from a, using generative AI, what is the customer expecting there? Would they be alarmed if they found out that generative AI was used? And then focusing more on the question you asked me, Will, which is about sort of employees in particular, it does raise the scope for employee misconduct, arguably. There could be instances where, you know, different minds will differ, but for example, employees could use ChatGPT to produce a deliverable or a work product, um, you know, representing that that's something they've done on their own accord when ChatGPT or some other platform has been used. And then the legal question that arises is, well, have has the employee done what they were supposed to do according to their job? That's going to be a question to be determined in due course. Well, you, you know, that's really interesting. I mean, six months ago, if an employee was asked to draft a paper or, or create some documentation, there's a reasonable expectation computers can't do that, right? You know, the, the employees exactly. got to do that. In, in the last six months, now we have this brand new capability and there's a question mark. What is the reasonable expectation? And so, but like you say, you know, no doubt this will get tested at some point. Also, like your point about transparency it sort of brings me maybe the next topic i want to talk about there's there's all the doom and gloom and the fraudsters are are going to do all this awful stuff but surely the good side is winning in this as well and tj how are we using this to actually detect fraud the exciting part of that will is the fact that you and i are dealing with this on a daily basis and we're working with our lawyers to really take this um, technology and make it part of our everyday service offering to clients the Great advantage about generative AI and similar technologies is the amount of data that you can analyze and the speed at which you can do that. So if you think from a detection perspective, you want to make sure that you can detect that potential transaction as close as you can to it happening in real time, because the, that will that will increase your chances of actually if there's a financial um loss through that, that you can actually recover that. So I think that's the key thing of this technology. It will help um, to make it much more real time that we can that we can detect it. If you think of current technologies where something similar is being used, so we spoke about earlier banks using it for in the financial crime sense. We've seen it being used in analyzing of voice. So to a customer and a call center person, for example, communicating with one another, looking at that voice um, and the emotive tone used in that conversation to detect, for example, a customer that's in distress. And you can immediately um, take that call center operator off the tools for 20 minutes or whatever the time is just for them to actually um, re re recompose themselves. The other one is an in internal audit where we initially we used a lot of sample based testing in internal audit. We only looked at like 10 percent of a sample of transactions. With this technology, you can really um, expand the coverage that you can get through that. So your likelihood of detecting something is, is, a, is a lot higher. What I think is going to happen is companies are going to deploy this technology more and more as part of business as usual. So you don't have to wait for an internal order to come through once a year to do that or um, a special review or a supplier that will come um, with their technologies to do it 
um, periodically, I think it's going to be very much a real time where you can deploy this technology in future. Well, that's an interesting point. And obviously, the detection technologies that are used today or were used six months ago are very much around structured data. So it's mathematical types of processes and natural language processing is always you know, looked at as a potential, but was really difficult historically. That's the flip side of generative AI. It can actually has really dramatically improved our natural language understanding capability. So being able to roll that into your real time detection, you know, can add a lot. But what about in the space of financial statement fraud? How how does this apply into that space, TJ? So, well, we still see often um, companies coming in the news because of financial statement fraud, companies that collapse as a result of financial statement fraud. What we see in the, the external order profession is very competitive. It's a competitive market um, and their margins are under pressure as well. As a result of that, they're almost being pushed to look at technologies that can make the audit process a lot more efficient and also help with their, with their margins. So um, your larger audit firms deploy a form of AI to test a company's trans tra transaction. So they may look at financial ratios that could be that could be at odds, for example, compared to the industry, or looking at specific accounting transactions that were posted to a cost center that's out of norm, or a high occur higher occurrence of reversals that may that may happen. So that information helped the audit team to really focus on the high risk areas in the audit. There's two issues of that. One is uh, the, the, this whole thing of the black box is that the, the users may not understand exactly what's the technology behind it. So um, it's not having the full context of those exceptions when they get reported to you. The other thing is over-reliance on the technology. So they, they, they could be a risk that audit teams um, rely too much on the results that are coming out of that, of that AI testing. You still need that professional skepticism to understand the full context of a transaction before um, to, make it, to make an informed decision and assessment about it. Um, the interesting part will be is whether this technology will be able to detect transactions that's been created through like synthetic data generation. So where the fraudulent transactions are modeled on the company's actual accounting structure. That, I mean, that time will, time will tell, but I think what, we'll, we will, what, what we'll see is that companies will start to deploy this technology long before the external order comes to the door that to actually detect and use that as a way to identify financial statement fraud. One of the points you made, TJ, I, I really liked in there, which is the human side of this. Uh, and it's important to remember all of this is technology, but the fraudster is ultimately a human. And ultimately on the good side as well, we're humans and we need to you know, think about all that as well. So it's it's a bit of both sides. And and maybe, Anania, to that point, um, how would we actually sum this up? What's your key takeaways in this space? Yeah, I think um, there's three key takeaways that come to me from that discussion we've just had. And the first is, we know that there's a risk that the crooks are going to be using generative AI to commit fraud. And that's something all organisations, I think, going forward will be more alive to if they're not already. On the flip side of that, we also have companies using generative AI for good. We know that the crooks are out there and we also can use generative AI to detect, to prevent. I think it will up the ante for firms and organisations to sort of also raise the bar for them as to how they're using generative AI. And then the last, I think, takeaway is a little bit related to the human element you were just talking about, Will, but almost in the middle there's that I would call it almost an ethical line as to how you manage generative AI in an appropriate way. So how will our employees use generative, generative AI in a way that is appropriate, is in a way that clients will be comfortable with? And that's something that I think as a, all industries will have to grapple with and come to an understanding of what role generative AI has to play in the workplace. Great. Thank you, Ananya. Thank you, TJ. And to our watchers, thank you for being with us on this journey. We've got a few more episodes lined up in this mini series, so we'll see you in the next one.